Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar with Peach Score and Forecaster. Uh, this today we'll be talking about what makes startups fundable. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you participate. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you shortly uh, after we're done recording. Uh, what I'd like to do is first introduce Jeff Erickson from Forecaster. Uh, Jeff, please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your uh, company, your entrepreneur background, and also about uh, being an investor. Oh, absolutely. Tara, thank you so much. Uh, so again, my name is Jeff Erickson. I'm currently with Forecaster, lead their partnerships team. And uh, before that, I was with Carta for four and a half years. So a lot of you probably know Carta if you're in the startup space, um, but joined them fairly early on um, and was part of some significant growth there. Um, again, that put me right in the middle of the startup space, which is where I love. Early on um, in my career, I joined an early stage startup and absolutely loved it. And I kind of got hooked to it early in my career. Um, my wife ended up starting a company. I helped to raise some capital and ended up helping run that business for about 10 years before we sold that to a private equity group. Um, so I also have experience as a founder myself, um, running a company. And um, I, like Tara said, I do a lot of angel investing. I think over the last two, two and a half years, I've made about 30 investments in different companies. And I love helping out founders. I sit on the advisory board for uh, several different startup companies and do a lot of mentoring for um, different accelerators, entrepreneur support groups and, and whatnot. So uh, excited to be here. And uh, I, I think we're gonna let Alex introduce himself as well. Is that right, Tara? Absolutely. Alex Tahiti, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for hosting this event. Please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about Peach Score and also about your entrepreneur and investor experience as well. Of course, thank you so much, uh, Tara. And uh, really excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, so a uh, little bit more about myself. I started uh, Peach Score uh, 15 months ago. Uh, back in 2013, uh, I founded a company called Telofine, which was time location unifier. Uh, it was a forecasting technology to predict trends in 24 different industries ahead of time. So we, to give you an example, it was Pokemon Go. Uh, before anyone knew about it, what is Pokemon Go, and the engine was able to tell you Pokemon Go is going to hit the market in six, three to six months, the U.S. market, basically. Uh, that company that company raised a few million dollars back then from a few VCs and CVCs, including uh, United Talent Agency, Lumo Pictures, Plug and Play, USC. And uh, when I finished the company, so the founder of Plug and Play, which was my previous investor, gave me a, an offer to join the management team. So I turned from the light side to the dark side, which is VC side, turned to VC. And uh, I, I managed fund invest in 18 companies. Uh, and uh, through that fund, uh, three exits so far. The next one is going to be announced uh, in two weeks. Uh, not by me, but by plug and play. That was a portfolio that I invested uh, through that uh, you know fund I was managing back then. And uh, also I founded the media and advertising practice uh, at plug and play in uh, focus on corporate innovation, running the access to program with uh, the rest of the uh, CVCs and then partnering with Amazon, AMC Networks, Denzu, Grupo Global, uh, USPS from Washington, and it was a very successful program that launched in 2019. And, uh, you know, and, and through all this experience that I've, you know, the years that I experienced as an entrepreneur and VC, I saw there's a gap and uh, within the startup existence, startup ecosystem. Uh, and, and in January 2022, I started a conversation with founders at PMP, Plug and Play, and I decided to leave and it started, uh, you know, Pitches Score, which we call it the world's first credit score for startups. Alex, I love it. I love this story because you saw the problem and you took responsibility and had the courage to address it. Uh, separately, I love to say that there's already a neat activity happening in the chat where the participants who are watching the live event 
are putting out their uh, contact information, including like their LinkedIn, please continue to do so. Let's make this as uh, community oriented as possible. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Tara Spalding. I too am a serial entrepreneur. I started two companies myself and I've exited one. Now I run Boom Startup Accelerator. Uh, we are an online and inclusive accelerator and we work with companies located from around the world. And I see a few from South Africa and outside of the United States already participating. That's wonderful. Uh, Boom Startup concentrates on financial and funding education and also access. Uh, outside of Boom Startup, I recently published 10 preparation stages to start a successful business. And that is a book designed to help founders substantially think through company creation uh, to hopefully improve their success rate when starting their business. Outside of that, I've worked with over a thousand companies just like Jeff and Alex, and um, I'm thrilled to moderate today's discussion about what makes startups fundable. So uh, thank you so much for the thoughtful introduction. Both of you are very well experienced and qualified to express what makes startups fundable. But let's start off by talking about market conditions because wow, we were at the top of the mountain and now we are certainly um, in some sort of accelerated dissension, but I'm not gonna say it's going down necessarily. I think it's a different landscape. Can you please tell me how this entrepreneurship landscape and market conditions is changing, especially in this last three years? Yeah, I, I can chime in real quick. Um, my thoughts, uh, it's definitely changed. I mean, you know, like you said, I mean, we were in this amazing bull market in the, particularly in the startup space and you saw a lot of capital flowing into, especially later stage companies. I mean, the, the size of the rounds and the amount of capital pouring into the later stage, you know, venture backed companies was crazy and and even the venture capitalists a lot of times they, they were saying the valuations are kind of insane right now but uh, there was this fear of missing out and people are still throwing money at, um, at all these companies that that has changed a little bit i'm i'm seeing you know i mean investors are definitely expecting valuations to come down we're seeing that uh, manifested particularly in later stage companies but um, I, I think, you know, founders right now are finding it a little bit more difficult to, to find funding because investors are, have got to be a little bit more picky about, you know, what they're going to invest in. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the, the landscape has changed for sure over the last six months, let's say. And, and I, would, I would say that we're going to continue to see, you know, things tighten up a little bit and until you know things kind of sort themselves out. Um, with that said, it's not all doom and gloom in my mind. I, no. There's still plenty of capital out there and good startups and good founders are going to get funded. So the capital is shifting in requirements when it comes to entrepreneurs accessibility. Alex, what do you think are um, the uh, signs or, or signals that entrepreneurs should be looking for? I mean, just, just you know, uh, to answer the question, like, like if you look at the like changes that happened over the last three years, I mean, we all experienced the last three years in changes, uh, and multiple uh, kind of waves uh, we experienced uh, worldwide. Uh, so many things change. Yeah, I mean, the world at a scale now experiencing and forced to adopt uh, new technologies and mindset, uh, like Zoom, that we are we have a conversation today, which is a result of that those changes. Uh, to prevent disconnectivity, like, right? I mean, uh, our conversation, again, uh, look at, like, before COVID, I never thought I'm going to meet with investors over Zoom and receive funds. I mean, uh, now we see that because there was no other option, uh, investors had to deploy their money uh, and, and, and entrepreneurs had to raise money. And uh, that was kind of the result of uh, changes that uh, now for the first time, entrepreneurs learn how to pitch online now investors learn how to uh, you know verify or qualify the companies to give them investment maybe for larger rounds they have to of course meet in person but uh, i think for angel investment uh, it, it makes it much much more easier for them to 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 adopt these changes and and invest in the companies 
Uh, so if you look at the ecosystem, the innovation pays uh, significant aspect of uh, through this new adoption, right? Uh, now, um, you know, the people, like people in this ecosystem, uh, especially, they, they learn how to communicate faster, how founders become more productive on, on, the, mm -hmm. on the positive side, right? The cost of starting a new business is significantly lower because like now, back in 2013, uh, uh, I had to commit for three years at least when I want to get my offers and I had to spend and look at a lot of money but now is is I can go to work, we work, and I, even after COVID, I don't need to be work. I can work from my home, and no one's gonna question my, uh, you know, uh, uh, why Alex and his team is working, uh, you know, not all at the same uh, place. Uh, I think, in my opinion, the, the private sector in general become more accessible for both a founder and those who want to support them. Okay. Uh, at the same time. Uh, I think we should admit that some behavior and, and fundamentals cannot replace in this ecosystem. Uh, you know, uh, you might uh, gain 10x more, um, uh, you know, um, exposure to, to meet with people much faster, but it doesn't mean you get 10x more trust on the, over the Zoom. Uh, trust, I think it's like marriage, like you can date people, online, but you have to meet with those people to take, take the relationship to the next level. And, Alex, uh, I think what you're saying is really keen, and I just want to make sure the audience is paying attention to it, is that, you know, there's still a diligence process that too is changing in the market condition and, and the diligence is definitely the key to the access of capital. Um, you've mentioned a couple other important points that I'd like to also reflect upon, you know, with COVID, we're, we're establishing these relationships virtually through the, the Zoom. Now, let's go into the access to capital in particular in the due diligence process. What kind of changes have you seen in this area over the last three years? Jeff, you wanna start first? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there was a, a frenzy of you know, grow at any cost doesn't matter how much it, it takes, but we're going to capture market share and there's plenty of money available and just grow at any cost. I think that mentality has shifted now. You've seen investors caution some of their you know, portfolio companies and say, actually, let's, let's pull that back and let's grow carefully, a little more carefully. And uh, let's look and make sure that we've got a pathway to, to profitability. And so if you, if you look at that from a, a new founder that's raising capital right now in those conditions, what your investors are going to be looking at is, do you have a pathway to profitability? And so, for example, at, at Forecast, I mean, we continue to see a increase in demand for financial modeling because there's a, new, a renewed emphasis on, you know, what does your financial model look like? What are the key metrics? Do you understand you know, your unit economics? And is this company going to be profitable ultimately? And what does that look like when? So you know, I think that's what we're seeing in terms of kind of the, the changing landscape. Um, Alex, I'd love to hear your, your take on that because I think it also fits into what Peach Shore is doing as well. You know, I, I think there's there's one confusion that is still within uh, uh, traditional investors that they they believe that uh, you know uh, art as science should be separate. Like I mean, uh, but I, I'm not uh, because each investor has different investment thematic thesis. Uh, but the foundation of this ecosystem forced to adopt new technologies and new mindset. Uh, I mean, even if I, I, you mentioned like, okay, before COVID, how many funds you know that they, they raised money over the call? Uh, maybe uh, they had a previous relationship. Yeah, when I started this company, I had a relationship. I just called and I said, this is what I want to start. And I already built the trust within the ecosystem to not like, uh, you know, meet them in person. That was much faster. But in general, I think due diligence uh, doesn't mean it's replacing human. The, the human uh, now needs to, I mean, even within the, look, look at the process. Uh, when someone approached you to raise money, you have, as an investor, you have to digest information. First, you have to gather information. That mm -hmm. gathering information is consuming. And, and, and when pandemic happened, 
now that the economy become more risky as for like for investors and, and those are kind of like of, uh, investing in the companies because of all the uncertainties in the war, uh, supply and chain, you know, interest rates, a lot of factors happen at the same time. Now the question, when, when that happened, if you look at like in the last three years, all the investors are, okay, now I'm disconnected uh, physically in, in person. Now let me rush to the digital world to, to see information about those companies that are, they want me to, to speak with them before call, during call, or after the call, right? Part of the due diligence. The problem was the ecosystem was not ready and still is not ready. I mean, there's nothing there. Everything that has built over the years was for only investors. There was not investors empowering, empowering investors with education, more data, business and intelligence, uh, and, 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 and what part of the do this is, is disrupted because when all this tool excluded the founders from all these equations, and we say, okay, you know, I just want to assess you. I don't care about assess. Of course, I'm going to assess you at the, at the end if I give you money. But uh, it was not a first kind of immediate uh, uh, need for for the ecosystem as far as like it was before pandemic. Now everyone rushed to the digital world. There's nothing there. There's no reliable data set, and founders are not part of those processes. Empower the founders if you want to do diligence them and give them uh, assist them with education with. Uh, business intelligence, let them to understand how the industry moves like you and your team is, is kind of experiencing this over time. I'm talking about savvy and uh, VCs, not angel investors. Uh, but at the same time, they will let you to have more information with respect to their privacy, which is <laughs> impacting the due diligence, uh, in, you know, a uh, result, uh, which uh, uh, you have tr you have a data that you can digest. And the part of your due diligence, when you have a reliable data that provided by founders, then you can make a proper and fast and better decision. You can review more deals. It, basically, the industry need to standardize the information delivery. Okay. Due diligence. That's that's my key point. No, I love it. I love this whole thing of like, you know, because of the new or the transformation of how investments are going down. It's it's rising the bar or the expectations for the the data that's communicated if it's a sound investment or not. Now let's talk about the new trend of entrepreneurs self-educating to resolve those problems, to get ready to hit that new bar. What are your thoughts about um, these sorts of uh, new trends that entrepreneurs are, are doing? I mean, uh, Alex, I would love to start with you on this. Uh, so the, the trends, I think, is the, the, the next generation of tools that I've seen within the last uh, two years uh, was the platforms that are empowering the founders. First, uh, spending and, and build tools to give them education, self-education. Like right now, if I tell you, oh, I want to paint my house, I go to YouTube, there's some, there's an answer for that. I can go and learn how <laughs> to, you know, to paint my house, right? For anything has an answer for uh, a startup ecosystem, uh, 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 the, 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 the way that uh, uh, you know, is being created or uh, maintained uh, was like the industry at a scale classified early stage businesses like on back, right? Uh, no education, no transparency, black hole, especially if you're zero to one million ARR uh, uh, is a binary. No one want to talk to you. The industry learned by force like in the past uh, stay, uh, you know, uh, uh, up to five year wait to see enough quantitative results. All the measuring system that's been created within the last 50 years solve for consumers, then for SMBs, then for public companies, and, and uh, people know how to communicate. It's not about how to evaluate, they know how to communicate uh, with a standard way. And uh, I think the trend is more education for founders, fast way, like. If I tell you that you, for your startup, you can get a loan like under safe or convertible loan, 50K, 100K uh, over your credit score, you might laugh. I say, Alice, is that why the possible? Yeah, if it's 1950s, uh, it never, people never thought that they can have a credit card and with the credit card and the credit score and report without even like uh, talking to anyone, just raise uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, get, you know, get money right from the bank, from lending. Sure. And, and these things change. And I think uh, for a startup ecosystem, a lot of things is already changing. If you look at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, look at JP Morgan, they're all sure. at the same time launching uh, different platforms 
to empower founders. They want to empower founders with different tools because they got into this conclusion if there's no is it new changes in the ecosystem, let's first put the fans on top, let them hear them, listen to what they need, uh, give them financial projection, like, give them uh, you know, a report so they understand against like 50 years data, like what they do at Pitcher Score, how they are doing and performing. It doesn't mean that you are good or bad, but it means that where you are in your journey. And, 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 and I remember to keep it, I wanna keep it short, but the, I remember back in 2013, when I started my previous company, I spent so much time to find a patent. I mean, my co-founders and I spent tens of thousands of dollars because I had wrong assumptions. I read a lot of articles. I got my masters in computer science. They were not kind of, but, but I was an entrepreneur, first time entrepreneur. I, I thought if I find a patent, I'm gonna protect myself. I thought uh, it's gonna just convince investors to give me money. And I was wrong because I spent so yeah. much on my love patent and talked to the lawyers. And I forgot that the main uh, focus for me is to build my company, talk to my customers, build my product. And we don't, I mean, I became a caveman back then because I built, I spent all my resources and sanity like for the first maybe few months to work on something that didn't have any, any, any outcome. And uh, to give you an example, like, uh, last two weeks, I met with few, uh, two entrepreneurs specifically, and I told them, give me the pitch deck, maybe I can help it with juice. I said, oh, oh I can't follow, uh, share the pitch deck. I said, why? I said, because I have to follow a patent first. Oh said, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Deep technology, we are deep technology. Typically in the last 50 years, I was in deep technology and software, but not, not hardware. But if your hardware, if you are making something that's visible as a TV, that you might someone's copy you, if it's a biotech, you, are, you have a, a cure for cancer, you have to, of course, file for FDA approval, but in general, the rest of the ecosystem, uh, typically entrepreneurs are not required uh, to follow by that, and this is education. Yeah, is yeah. Trend. Well, and I like what you're saying, which is, you know, listen, first and foremost, you got to get into back to the foundations of the business. Separately, there's a lot of platforms that are proliferating, especially from multiple sources, including, you know, uh, funding sources to really focus on the founders. And Alex, I really like what you were also mentioning about the zero to $1 million founders, which are the ones that need the most support because they're basically very, very vulnerable uh, to situations. But uh, Jeff, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, entrepreneurs self-educating themselves and, and sure. what they're doing now to resolve business problems, especially when it comes to becoming fundable. Yeah, I, one of the trends I continue to see is the knowledge used to be kind of concentrated in Silicon Valley. And that's why everybody go to, to Silicon Valley, because that's where the investors were educated, the founders were educated, and that's where you go to get educated. With, the, with COVID, it blew all of that up. People from Silicon Valley were now moving to other parts of the country or world, and that knowledge continued to disseminate. And I think we continue to see that, which is a great thing for some of these other ecosystems. And so you see these ecosystems all throughout the US and even worldwide popping up and they become centers of education for founders. And I think that's the key thing is you're, you're seeing more and more accelerators, entrepreneur support groups, um, your incubators or startup studios, um, you know, venture services firms. There's all kinds of, of firms that are, are meant to help entrepreneurs start their businesses. There's, you know, uh, there's just a, a community being built everywhere, um, it seems. And I mean, it's great to see. I love to see that where entrepreneurs can kind of take the education into their own hands and join these groups. But I think the other key there, and Tara, you probably see this with Boom Startup, is there's a real benefit for founders coming together with other founders. You start to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think with, with COVID, you saw a lot of, you know, a lot of these opportunities where it was connecting online with whether it was other founders or investors or whoever. But I think there's now a push to get people together and that there's something powerful about founders being around other founders. And you almost mentor each other through that whole process. And I think that's an important ingredient 
for the startup education is having others that are going through similar things or that have just gone through what you're going through as a founder becomes invaluable. And so I, I, I think we're going to continue to see, you know, more and more of those support organizations or accelerators. Uh, there's certainly a continues to be a great need for that. I think we'll continue to see the success of a lot of great organizations like that, that will help founders, you know, be more successful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jeff, statistically speaking, you know, Boomstarp is one of 3,000 accelerators that participate in the global accelerator network. <clears throat> and there are several others, including incubators that aren't aligned to those, but they're local resources. One of the advantages that I've seen in particular over the last year is to work with um, economic councils from other countries where we cross pollinate. And it's um, very advantageous because it allows us to basically leverage local resources, starting with the person first and um, connect and do that brain share. I also think it ties back to Alex's point where there needs to be a uh, basically a, a foundational communication platform as to the components of the business. Um, you know, of course, English is kind of the standard language when it comes to business, but there are certain aspects when it comes to those growth, especially in those sort of pivotal moments. So I love what you're saying. I do agree that there's a lot of academic extensions outside of universities and, and a proliferation of online resources to help companies grow to be fundable. I also see in the chat a communication about uh, being uh, capital conscious and also self-sustaining. And that is absolutely the trend that we're seeing at Boom Startup as well, um, especially for preparation of pre-seed. Um, it is very difficult now um, for ideas to get funded. Uh, we're looking for dollars for traction. So to answer that question that came in, very good question, yes. Uh, next, uh, the outcome of these changes with self-education and uh, basically uh, self-reliance on solving these business problems uh, outside of building a strong network. What are savvy net, uh, entrepreneurs doing to like save costs or to act faster? Uh, that includes failing. And Alex, you, you had a funny comment before, which is you can't learn entrepreneurism, you can only experience it. Mm -hmm. So um, love to hear from you, uh, Alex, about you know, what are savvy entrepreneurs doing uh, nowadays to really improve the efficiencies in their business growth and funding preparation. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so to, to, to look at the, 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 the stats, I'm talking about the stats, what it has, because our job at PG School is to just analyze the data like from the industry. What we have seen, uh, which is close to what articles or some people already spoke about that, the chance of certain entrepreneurs with exit uh, compared to first entrepreneurs is 30% more. That 30% is education, and that 30% is a lot. And, and what they are experienced and, and, and how they're saving costs these days, first, uh, they, they cut all the unnecessary costs. Like they know how to kind of, uh, you know, to give you an example, I have a lawyer, I paid almost zero dollar uh, and we raised a few million dollars so far, but you know, you have, you, you, I'm now educated. After years, I know how to discuss with lawyers and present my company to convince them to give me default fees. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs I've seen like uh, so far, the first time entrepreneurs they'll say, oh, I have to go and pay 600 bucks an hour to the lawyer. No, you don't need to do that. And, 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 and if you want to do that, you're going to be bankrupt before you even you start uh, your business. So there are a lot of these experiences, like I've seen a lot of companies like uh, they, uh, there's on, a certain entrepreneurs with, uh, they have dealing with much less dilution because they know what is the, the, how much uh, shares they have to put as a call option for their employees, for their the advisors, how to negotiate about the terms. Uh, I saw a company that raised uh, three and a half million dollars. They, in the pre-seed, they gave us six to 70% of their companies with the first investor, 70%. This is like, uh, you know, it's not normal. And that company shut it down. I mean, if you use it as far as I, I, I learned and I talked to the founders, I said, I didn't know that I should give. The investor told me I'm going to give you three and a half million dollars, not savvy investor. And they asked for 70% of the company and in pre you shouldn't give up your power to the, to the, uh, to the, to the uh, investor. Typically, investors should let you to run your business because you are the founder 
and you you are the best person to manage your company. So a lot of these things for serial entrepreneurs is already solved. Uh, you know, and 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 they are they know how they can save costs. These days, save costs and and just focus on customers. Like uh, what I did, like this time, uh, I built a product with our customers. I didn't spend money on the, like API integration. I built the API. I got the money from the customer. I built the API for them. I knew how to do it, but I save costs on un unnecessary. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, headaches and, and building something that no one is going to use it, and then I have to redo the whole thing with the with the tours uh, of the cost that I already uh, spent. So a lot of these things, I believe that you don't need to expense yourself. Yeah, how? What is my business model? You can see the top most popular business models or successful companies, uh, uh, what they did. But actually, you have to expense yourself. Some stuff you can't. Uh, you know, you have to just do it and see it. Each case by case might be different. It's impossible for the founders to even first first second entrepreneurs might fail the second and third time. Uh, it doesn't. There's there's no guarantee. Was a lot of part and and, and 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 you can save time. If you save time, you can build faster. If you have more data about the successful companies or how they are building the companies, you can save costs. When you save costs, you can pivot faster. You can fail faster. You can build faster which I think these are the keys that the, the, the first entrepreneurs, uh, uh, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them need uh, education. Like uh, they, they, a lot of them they are asking, they're spending so much time. Okay, Alex, what is the difference between SQL and SQL Delaware? Uh, what is, so these are education, right? I don't need to educate myself again, what is yes. SQL Delaware? And these are saving time in this economy, uh, which is uh, every penny matters. In this game, every penny matters. and. Uh, you have to be really uh, cautious about every penny that you're spending from your time or money that is your money or your investment. It doesn't matter because the same money. Money is for you, either from coming from your own pocket or coming from the investor's pocket because you're, uh, again, partnering crimes. And that is uh, what I've seen that same entrepreneurs, significant, not 100%, not but even if you want to go with the stats, 30%, uh, you know, um, uh, have better chance because of all those experiences that already have done uh, through the years. Yeah, and I also saw, Alex, that in an SMB survey hosted by the U.S. government, I believe it was 2020 data, the first $75,000 for every startup is funded by the founders, mm -hmm. uh, you know, straight out of their pocket uh, for the first year. And so, you know, your point about making sure that the whole plan and runway makes sense, has a break-even point, um, and is something that will absolutely be repaid by the customers is, is just so savvy. Um, Jeff, in another conversation, you know, talking about funding and, you know, the next round of funding after that $75,000, now the cost of that capital, especially equity driven is certainly increasing. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the cost of equity and, and the whole dilution aspects nowadays? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I think that you're gonna see more and more founders, especially in this environment, uh, bootstrapping. And so using that $75,000. And just to come back to, to Alex's point there, where he's talking about, being able to, to you know, save time and focus your efforts on the business, it, it enables you to move faster and, and do things more efficiently. And some of that comes back to you know, that $75,000, how far is that gonna get you through the bootstrapping? And, and it may have to get you a little bit further along before you really become fundable, but there are some great resources out there. And, and one of the things that makes run, you know, starting a business today so much easier than 10, 15 years ago, is you've got all of these software applications. You've got you know, something to manage your cap table. You don't have to figure all this out and build your spreadsheets. You've got stuff done for you. you you've got things that can help you with financial modeling. You can, you've got legal docs that, and data rooms and, and things like that that you had to build. Now they're all built for you. You can plug in and play, but the other thing that's out there in the market is there's a lot of these software providers that have these efficiency tools that they want you as a startup founder to use their software and they know that you can't afford it. And so they'll give you big discounts or they'll sometimes let you use it for free. Take advantage of all those things. There's, there's a ton of, of 
opportunities out there. A lot of founders don't know about it. Um, a quick plug for the startup stack. I mean, go to mystartupstack.com and you've got, you know, $400,000 worth of, of perks for early stage founders. Things like that can help your $75,000 or whatever that ends up being go a lot further. And so take advantage of things like that. When it comes to dilution, like Tara was saying, equity is an expensive form of capital. And so you definitely want to be careful and mindful about, you know, when you start to, to raise capital. And a lot of times, you know, early on, you're going to probably do, do it through a safe and easy, uh, a quick and easy way, like a safe or a convertible note. And, you know, it, again, that's a great mechanism to raise early capital because it's inexpensive, it's fast, it lets you keep focusing on your business. Um, but there are some cautions there as well uh, that, that have to do with dilution. Too often you start to see founders where they'll, they'll go out with a safe round and they'll have a, a low cap and a, a discount on the safe. And, and they just, they, they see that an investor wants to put more in. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll just leave it open. Then they leave it open for more and more. Right. And like, oh, they start taking more and more capital on thinking, hey, this is free money. We haven't really... We haven't set a valuation. You hear that said a lot of times. Well, actually, if you've got a cap on there, you have set a valuation and you're going to get diluted at that cap um, the more money you take on. And so be, be mindful about that. And again, there are tools out there to help you to model that out and say, well, what happens to when these convertible instruments convert into equity and what happens to my, my dilution? You know, how do I get diluted as a, as a founder or my employees or previous investors? That's all stuff you have to be on top of. And when it comes back, you know, circling all the way back to what makes a company fundable. One of the things is, is being on top of your equity. You need to understand the impact of taking on that investment. Um, and then even looking out ahead of what additional capital is going to be needed after that. You have to know all of that type of stuff as you go into your funding rounds. Um, and, and again, that's gonna increase the confidence of your investors when you start to, to dig into things like that with them. Well, and the one thing that I really admire about Peach Score and Forecaster is that y'all support fundable startups by blending data and experts. Uh, both of your entities have an evaluation and an education as well as like a path on guidance. But then you also offer support by experts who really have that deep knowledge. If you can just talk a little bit about how advantageous that is, especially on, you know, first time found or two first time founders who are trying to make decisions uh, quickly that aren't, like you said, Jeff, detrimental to their ownership. Yeah, I, I can jump in there. I, I think with, with Forecaster, the thing that drew me to Forecaster um, was really that it is helping increase the likelihood of success for startups. And, and so I love that mission. I love uh, being part of that. And what I mean by that is that if a founder knows what their financial model, you know, and if they can build a financial model and then use that to create different scenarios, they can, they, they're now going to stay on top of their cash burn. They know their runway. They know when to raise capital, um, how much to raise, at what point. They know who to hire and when. All of these things are strategic decisions that founders need to, to you know, be able to make good, solid decisions based on data. And so, and then the other point to that is that as, as the company progresses, you know, you may be off on your projections, but you can update those on a monthly or however often you're going to do that. And that's going to help you make better strategic decisions based on the data that comes in and is updated on a consistent basis. And so I, I've heard it said that, that no financial model is accurate, but there are some of them that are actually useful. And you want to have a useful or beneficial financial model to help you make strategic decisions and de-risk the investment in the eyes of your investor. 
So that's where that's why I love Forecaster and where it's uh, it is playing into helping uh, increase the the likelihood of success for founders. Alex, would you mind telling us more about Peach Score in this whole narrative? So I want to add something to what to what, to what uh, Jeff mentioned about the forecast. Uh, what, what I love, I mean, this is this is what I see in the market. Founders can uh, that can prove that product market fit and, and a, a business model that can scale are gonna stay in this market. This market is about to survive for now. I'm not talking about few months. We don't know maybe it get worse or not. But again, uh, as you see, the, like Sequoia or uh, YC's, uh, uh, you know, warning notice to their portfolio companies. This is like is not a 40, 40, 45 percent of the money already dry. Uh, out from the like the, the, the same as the same last year that the, the investors invest in the companies. And what I like, uh, if you want to find, uh, if you want to find a product market fit, that means you want customers. If you want customers, that means you need to have a projection on your revenue and your user growth. That means, uh, I think that's where forecaster comes uh, uh, that uh, you force as a founder because Again, at the end of the day, forecasting uh, for investors is requirement, but they want to see how you understand how to do to build a business or not. Because no, everyone knows, as Jeff said, like uh, all these numbers change. Who knows what is going to happen in five months for, for my company? Maybe the revenue goes to like five hundred million, it will stay like nothing. But you need as a founder to know how to build a business and make money. At, all, at the end of the day, this is a profitable business, non-profit. Is, you are not a non-profit to say, okay, I'll give, just keep me, giving me money for another 10 years so I can build and make it successful. You have to have a roadmap. You need to understand how to get to that numbers. And, and that's what I like because like uh, about forecast that you force to sit and think about your business model, how you want to adopt it, how you want to scale it, how many users are projecting. Uh, typically, if you don't put any milestone and, and, and goal for yourselves, uh, you will never make it. I mean, even if it's a rest, sometimes I'm, I'm having this conversation with some of my team members. So, Alex, you told us to get to, I don't know, 5,000. This is impossible. I said, oh, I don't know. Just get it to 5,000. If I get see that this is going to get to 2,000, then we will adjust. You have to try. You have to start from somewhere with the best guess estimate. And then on top of that, build the company, which is, I think this is, uh, I, I love about uh, what uh, uh, you know forecaster does to help entrepreneurs to get to that point, uh, you know, and, and understand the financial position modeling uh, to build, build their business. But about which is for what we did, uh, you know, uh, the reason I started pitches for was I've seen like there's a long missing, uh, long waiting time for the founders. There's a there's a disconnectivity with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, there is, uh, you know, tens of thousands of requests coming from the startup ecosystem for lending purposes, they're coming for corporate innovation, because at the end of the day, if you're B2B or B2B2C, you need someone to give you money. That means there are corporations. And if you can build your product with them, if you can pilot with them and get money from them, because they have so much money and, and, and much easier to get to revenue more than getting probably investors, yeah. then build a much better successful company because you can stay in the market with the revenue with revenue on, and you build an scalar company with customers not not alone so that's why with the way that we did it we thought okay if the we well, i teach you school within the last 15 months we analyzed decades of worth of data from venture capital industry to build a multi-dimensional system that tailored to a startup ecosystem uh, that value over 900 uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, key metrics in the company. I'm saying yeah. qualitative and quantitative because all the traditional like, measuring systems that they try to fit in uh, founders and startups, the early stage businesses, it doesn't work. All about qualitative. That's why there's uh, investors and angel investors really care about uh, the founders, uh, you know, okay, themselves sure. because they are asset in the company. They're pro you are selling the future of the company. There's nothing existed today. So you're selling yourself to investors that I can deliver this. And they know that you might have pivot, but a strong uh, is a qualitative basis. We can't just go with measure of quantitative. Oh, do you have revenue? Buy. Binary. And, and, and that's what we, we try to analyze that. We build that. Uh, you know, uh, an engine and system that is able to create a, a real-time, uh, full detail report uh, for founders. We call it business intelligence report as part of our core offering that founders can get on the platform 
and, and, and get continuous uh, monitoring and benchmarking the compounds, find about the strengths and weaknesses, especially if they're first time entrepreneurs and they just started and they're limited in resources to and see how they can improve the metrics over time. More important, uh, uh, you know, uh, once they get their information in private, which is because we are empowering the founders, uh, we are trying to connect them directly to large institutions and the decision makers uh, 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 to secure capital, help them to close new contracts with them and, and, and uh, find early customers for their products uh, through the fast track process. So this is, there's no, basically we are not going to do anything. The engine, we create a gravity between network and transaction with a layer of the intelligence and data in the middle. I love it. So basically, by standardizing this information, you're blending the data and experts. The experts are that ecosystem. And then there becomes this trusted data sharing uh, that's happening within the ecosystem. Because like you said, there are many paths to capital uh, for companies. So basically, uh, you know, Alex, step one would be, hey, get onto the platform, get your first report going and understand the vulnerabilities. And then step two is to look at Forecaster and to really understand what is the runway or the, the length of business as well as opportunities to grow your pipeline uh, by leveraging the, the data and the analytics that both of your platforms have provided. This is, this is fabulous. Um, you know, whether- uh, can I start, can, can I add something to to what? Of course. Uh, so 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 very interesting. I met with two German co-founders uh, last week. Uh, each of them raised between thirty to fifty million dollars. They came from Germany to the U.S. and they want to expand their business. And they said, Alice, we have zero idea how to even start in U.S. and how the investors, corporations in general, how in U.S. I can build my company. I have I'm very successful in Germany, but. Uh, he didn't know anything. So uh, as, as a test, we onboarded him on the platform and to learn. And it was very useful. I mean, def definitely uh, like uh, he onboarded some of his team members and co-founders, but I think more than US, the global, market, if you look at that at the scale, global side, uh, there's a lot of opportunity because if you, it's still US is one of the biggest hubs, the, the largest hub in, in innovation. And, and uh, of course now China, Japan, Germany, Australia, Canada, they're all building at the same time, but there's a lot of learning in this country over the years, which I think by the analysis that we have done, uh, it, it gives a, a lot of good directional information to the founders, even if they are outside the United States and they want to expand and move to the United States. And uh, uh, I know we are short in time, but the last piece of the thing that the, the previous asking question you asked, uh, we have how many uh, accelerator programs we have uh, in the United States? 300, 400? Uh, and, and, <laughs> you know, I think in, in, in global, we have 4,000, uh, 90% of nonprofit, but average each of these access to accepting 50 companies. They're amazing, we need more, but at a scale, 0.0001% of the entire ecosystem have chance to go to access to programs. And those access to programs are amazing, but it doesn't mean if you're not among the, those 2,000 companies, well, like, then you are not qualified to build your company. It's still those, 99% of the ecosystem, they need education. They need to experience the same way that someone experienced at YC. This is a chance and fair for everyone to experience the same network, education, mentorship, uh, you know, uh, like anyone else. Like, like your access to is amazing, I'm sure. But again, is, is at a scale if you're talking about these things, I think uh, with a number of 26% increase over the year, uh, year over the year of uh, and the adding new compounds with this ecosystem, I think we can do much better at scale solving this problem for everyone. Oh, that's great. I agree. Uh, there's so much more that uh, learning that can be dispersed. And to Jeff's point earlier, you don't necessarily have to go to Silicon Valley uh, to receive it. But let's go to like, how does science empower better decision-making, not only for the entrepreneurs, but also for the investors on these funding moments? Jeff. Yeah, I, one thing that you see there that, has, that we continue to see be a big benefit on both sides is that transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you're, when you're meeting with investors, 
you're looking at a long-term relationship. And so, I mean, it's beneficial for both sides to be transparent with each other. And I think that technology or science um, can help with that. Um, an example, I mean, with, with Peach Score, I mean, it's giving you transparency into that business. It's like, here is our business and here's these different pieces that fit into our, our FICO score more or less. Um, with Forecaster does the same thing, creating transparency where you can actually sit down with your investors, you pull up your financial model and you say, what happens if this happens? Let's run the scenario. Okay, maybe we needed to raise a little bit more money or maybe we don't need that much and maybe it's gonna help you know, decrease the dilution for the founders. All of those things, you can now use the tools to be in partnership with your investors. It's not us versus them. It's, hey, let's make the right decisions for the company. And that transparency is really facilitated through technology. And so that's something I, I love about you know, entrepreneurship and, and the evolution of you know, technology. We're seeing continued innovation in the startup space. I see more and more startups that are focused on helping other startups. And I love seeing that. So um, that's kind of how I see, you know, science or technology benefiting both sides of the equation there. No, I, I think it's pretty awesome. Alex, do you have anything else to add? Just want to quick add, because, you know, Jeff already covered uh, <laughs> all the most important points here. But uh, as I, I mean, I believe like this is, uh, as Oliver said, that data is king and money is power. Right. So we, when we mix these two, then the magic happens. Uh, we can, uh, to make a better decision, more efficient and, and, and uh, especially online with a new kind of this type of like behavior, like uh, changes that we have seen over, over the last uh, three years, I think to get the, 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 the science can, you can, the science can empower the, the art of God fully. I'm not saying the art of God fully is going to replace forever, especially uh, even my, myself when I raised some I mean, in this uh, my previous round, I had to go to hiking with my invest potential investor. I I sat and because that was like, like if I did a lot, I travel. He traveled to LA, but again, that is like social. We are social creatures. We cannot replace that. This is our nature. We are human. And this is not. And and even we are talking in private sector. If it's my money, I want to invest my money to the company. I love the founder. I can communicate with them. I can sit with them. And, and, and they're kind of matched. It doesn't mean that person is bad or I'm, I'm good or it's not about that. It's about matching the personality between uh, chemistry. We call it chemistry between investors and founders. But science can help a lot to provide much faster uh, information and accurate information for the ecosystem, not only founders, uh, but anyone who wants to support them to, uh, you know, uh, you know to, to make a better and faster and proper decision. A lot of them you look at like uh, uh, you know uh, the, what it is happening in the ecosystem. A lot of time, uh, uh, when I was founder, I thought a lot of these VCs are uh, bad persons. I don't want to just use the bad word, but uh, but again, they are they are they are not. They don't care. That is ego. The ego is with money. Yeah, of course, anywhere you see power and money, ego comes with that. That's 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 type of like worldwide. Not only for VCs. In general, ego is everywhere. It's not only for VCs, but again, I, 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 then uh, because I send an email and never respond back, and said, "Okay, why they don't respond to me? Why they don't explain five pages to me? Why they don't they're passing or they're not investing in my company?" When I join Plug and Play, then I realized, no, these people are good people. They just have, don't have bandwidth. There are hundreds of thousand applications a year. There's so much portfolio companies. There's so much going on. And also like us that we have to deliver our milestones. They have to deliver the milestones to LPs and GPs and all those like uh, people that are supporting them. And, and, and I thought, okay, they don't have time. If they send me five uh, pages reason that why they are passing my company or they don't have late response, that means uh, you know, they, they have to sit and become consulting company to give feedback to the founders. So it's not all about that. So science can help this. Science yeah. can provide information much faster because if you look at what I did, I sat and observed the venture team for, for months and say how they are to understand who am I, they go to Crunchbase, Pitchbook, then LinkedIn, then they search on different tools to see uh, what is your real name, who, where you came first. 
Mm-hmm. So much, this is wasting time. So if you want to learn that, if you can learn it in five minutes, why, if I can save in each, uh, you know, uh, in general, any tool, not only picture school, we can save uh, investors time to digest information in five minutes, less than 30 minutes or a week, or especially a day, or especially for CVCs, this process is much longer because they have to go with the guidelines and they, they, they have to go step by step to when they are talking to the founders. Very complex. And if you, that's why it takes six months to even start the conversation with CVCs. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't, they can, like angel investors, they have no rules. I don't need to go to the, to this, uh, uh, the, the corporate and the HR to respond. But even though that is a lo- uh, a slow. So long story short, science can solve to deliver the information much faster and add a layer of intelligence to interpret the data, so what they're expecting to see. That's um, right. You know, I, I love to emphasize that point uh, because we have a lot of uh, comments coming in on the chat. Uh, like it or not, it, when you're starting your business, your information is going to be tracked at least by your bank, uh, primarily by platforms and ecosystems that are data-driven, such as ours, like even our accelerator uses an AI formula to identify which companies are on the fast track compared to others. And it is absolutely important um, to uh, make sure that you're leveraging these platform systems to get that sort of guidance. Every single platform systems uh, that I am familiar with, uh, and certainly on this webcast, are more about uh, focusing on your company viability. But this information, and, and feedback and reports are things that uh, angel investors, venture capitalists, private equity groups, uh, entities that would want to acquire your company are still going to expect during this diligence process. And as we started off this today's communication, diligence process is getting to be so much more ingrained and it's slowing down because guess what? Capital can now be picky again in today's market. So I love to uh, uh, just end with our last question, which is like, I'll give a minute to each. Alex, uh, what are your tips or advice for the entrepreneurs that are on today's call about preparing for funding? Uh, Funding, I I think my my quick uh, uh, two cents uh, for them is, um, even if they're in fundraising mode, they really need to have all the answers ready for investment. In this market, uh, especially like investors looking for hard numbers, user revenue, user growth, revenue growth, they want clear answer and you have to see it. And, and they have to, you have to give them the confidence and, and, and a little bit hard with only idea, raise a, 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 few, a few million dollars uh, today because, uh, you know, again, what I saw and what I'm seeing on the investors, a lot of them is still have that money, but they are putting that money to support the existing portfolio companies. More money. Basically, they are allocating more money to support the existing portfolio companies. They are still investing. The money is out there. And, and, and as long as you can answer those questions, uh, then you uh, are able to raise money from uh, angel investors or micro VCs. Uh, my recommendation, if you started today, if you're first on to, don't go after micro business. Waste your time. Build relationship with them, but don't expect money comes from them. Go to the angel investors. Those are you know in your network. This market I always, I said, like is a raise a smart money, not dumb money. But if you are seeing an opportunity to raise some dumb money, but have a plan for that money. Don't just say, oh, I'm gonna start a business if you give me five hundred thousand dollars. No. Have a plan, sit and really think about your company and your roadmap and, and, and first make it more, as much as you can make it efficient. Build it with customers. Don't go with hypothesis. The test of A-B testing is very cheap and doesn't have cost for you. You don't need $500,000 to launch your product. Uh, you, you know, you need probably, uh, because some of them say, oh, I need $500,000 to start or launch my product. No, you never, you don't need that money. Don't spend more your money. If you want to uh, uh, go and hire people from outside, if in US, if you're looking for engineers, go to like other side of the globe. I mean, this is how most of the companies, even big companies, are doing that to save costs. And don't uh, waste your money on on on, on uh, you know on something that's not as you know.
that's my two cents. I love it. I love it, Jeff. Um, yeah, I, one of the things Alex mentioned is, you know, there's so many variables that go into investors making decision on making an investment. So some of the, the things that I would coach my, you know, my founders on is one, research your investors. No, you know, don't waste your time going after investors that aren't going to write you a check. Um, and you can do that through simple diligence on your own part of, you know, seeing what portfolio companies they have, who they invest in, what sectors, all that type of stuff. So first, research your investors, uh, know your investors, know your numbers. So get a good financial model, build it out and be able to talk to your numbers and know them inside and out, um, you know, before you, you meet with your investors. Know your equity, get that straight, make sure everything's up to date, your cap table is accurate and complete. Um, and then know your pitch, you know, come across professional, um, pitch like a pro. And then finally, put it all together in a data room so that it's nice and organized. The diligence process is easy for your investors. It increases the confidence of your investors, uh, which is really the key to being fundable increase the, the confidence and uh, hopefully you'll see some checks come in. Thank you, Jeff. And my advice to add on to everything that Alex and Jeff said is break into ecosystems. Uh, don't allow being virtual as a hindrance. Uh, the more that you participate personally in person or personally online doesn't make a difference. Uh, but there's a ton of communities and ecosystems that are really focused on startup businesses that are willing to uh, provide introductions, network support, mentoring, uh, you know, to really just improve your business. And the best capital of all is non-dilutive capital. And the most important non-dilutive capital is sales. So I always say, start with sales and, uh, you know, just, just focus there and the rest will come. Well, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yes, ahead, thank you. Thank you, Tara, for, for leading the discussion. And Alex, it's always great to, to chat with you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And then, Such by the way, if you didn't answer a lot of questions, feel free to send me an email. My email is alex at pitcherscore.com. Happy to answer all your questions that I didn't get a chance to go over today. Yes, and likewise, I'll share my info as uh, jeff at forecast or dot co forecast with an r and then dot co so thanks everybody for joining thank you thank you thanks guys